Over the years, I realized that sometimes going to the basics is what helps our patients the most. Going back to nature and being less stressed out and more tranquil and at peace are invaluable techniques and assets in our clinic. So I want you to experience that. The first thing that I do with my patients is give them essential oils. Essential oils will go into the nose when inhale, into the olfactory nerve, into the hypothalamus, amygdala, pons, within a matter of minutes. It will increase the secretion of dopamine and serotonin, which are the feel-good hormones. So immediately we have a more receptive patient, more at peace. The second thing I do is I ask him, where do you have pain? And I say, just point to where you have the pain. And I put three blends that we prepared called pain blend circulation and peppermint. There's obviously peppermint, birch, clary sage, sage, lavender, myrrh, rosemary, marjoram. And with these oils, we have relief of pain, which uh, most of the population is suffering from. 60% of the population has low back, low back pain. Can you imagine that? So it's a major problem. Once we do those two strategies, we have an improvement. So if you want to experience that right now, we have a doctor that has kindly agreed to whoever has pain, you can come over here in a line and we'll apply the oils to you. And then we'll apply oils to your hand. We'll go through the table and I'm trying to decide which one of the two. Uh, there's only two contraindications for essential oils. One is ylang ylang can lower blood pressure. We're not using that today. The other one is that rosemary, when ingested, can cause uterine contractions. So it's contraindicated, ingested by female patients. So is anybody pregnant here today? No. And nobody's going to ingest the rosemary. We're going to inhale it. If you're interested in doing this, put your hand out. They'll put a drop in your skin. Rub your hands. And it's already killing bacteria, viruses, and fungus in your hands, staying underneath the skin and working for many hours after that. So it's better than a gel to kill influenza virus. Inhale, hold your breath, and continue doing that. It will make you more alert, more focused, and more open to lectures and learning. So the doctor will first... Well, she's going through the table, so you tell her about what you need. So I have no financial ties with any of the sponsors and companies related to this presentation. And I wanted to mention to you some of the things that we're seeing that are simple and are increasing their survival in cancer patients and other illnesses, like e exercise. These are the questions that I present to regular oncologists when I present in the United States and Puerto Rico. Ex true or false, exercise may be detrimental to most patients with breast cancer because it may spread cancer cells. False. True or false, antioxidants such as vitamin C and glutathione neutralize the beneficial effects of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, or a combination of the above. False, except when we're, they're given together, like Dr. Levy was saying. But we never do that. True or false, promoting a healthy state of mind, emotions, and consciousness through the method known as intentional connectedness may double survival and reduce recurrence rates by half in breast cancer. True. That's amazing. And we don't use it enough. A physician's emotional, mental, physical, and psychological state, meaning you, has nothing to do with curing their patient's cancer. False. It does have to do. It has been shown that environmental pollution causes at least 95% of all cancers. True. That's a high number. Removing the toxins that cause cancer can make the cancer get better or disappear. True. Nutritional approaches during cancer therapy can increase response rates and reduce complications. True. So you know about integrated medicine. We've been talking about that a lot. But what about the studies that show that this is true? Connecting and being heard. Spiegel, he studied the effect of psychological treatments and just simple breathing techniques. Weekly 90-minute sessions for one year. And this was in The Lancet in 1989. And since then, we haven't heard much about that. 
But the support group versus the control group survived twice as long, 18 versus nine months. If this was chemotherapy, it would have been all over the news. And this is just simple support group that promotes peace and tranquility. That's why I use the essential oils, because it promotes peace and tranquility in a subconscious and objective manner that we can reliably use to assist our patients, not just with cancer, but other diseases. In another study, a melanoma randomized study, these are randomized studies, and the physicians after surgery in these patients did just six weeks of support group. And after the six weeks, they were followed for, uh, for an adequate amount of time. The recurrence rate was, recurrence rate after surgery was 50% less in patients that underwent the support group and their survival was double. I mean, this is quite incredible. And these studies have been largely ignored. The Ornish program, which Medicare reimburses, by the way, for patients that have had heart disease, which basically randomize bypass surgery and stents versus a predominantly vegetarian diet, meditation, and exercise, it actually was equivalent or better because not only did it did the survival was comparable or better in many subsets compared to the surgery, but it opened up and reversed heart disease, in other words, reverse stenosis in patients in order or other arteries that the bypass surgery and the stents are not treating. So that's a, a major improvement. Again, it was largely ignored. But bonding and interaction and being at peace is very important, being tranquil. We have now a major epidemic in Puerto Rico of stress after the hurricane. Basically, all of us got some type or another of post-traumatic stress disorder. And now, a year later, we're realizing that we had it, and we're, getting, we're starting getting out of that. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing. You don't realize it until you get out. But one of the most powerful tools that we have to significantly alter the course of a person's clinical illness is the related depression and anxiety. And what is depression and anxiety besides a high oxidative stress? It's also lack of nutrition and lack of production of dopamine and serotonin. So this is one of the tools that we use, essential oils. I'm trying to get your serotonin and dopamine up this morning. How many of you have used it now for the pain? For pain, the oils? One, two, okay. And of course, the mechanism of action of, of isolation are many, lowering immune system, NK cells, worsening uh, glucose response, decreased immune response, and increased high blood pressure. Mind-body medicine as a uh, practice by Benson, who has done a lot of work with meditation in, in uh, Massachusetts have shown that meditation can improve the hypertension, insomnia, stress, energy metabolism, inflammation, pain reduction, activation of hematopoietic stem cells, acceleration of wound healing, increased cortical thickness. So we want to see how we can uh, promote this technique in our patients because it will increase survival, increase uh, well-being, decrease recurrence rates, and th this is quite uh, amazing for, for a simple tool. And with meditation, you can use music, you can use guided meditation. I always start using essential oils because it starts setting up the patient for calmness. And we designed a meditation CD. We did the music and a guided meditation and we put 50 patients to listen to this twice a week for two weeks. And at the end of those two weeks, there was a decrease in pain medications in 50% of the patients. All of these patients were cancer patients. There was also a decrease in hypertensive medications in 20% of the patients. And there were more common focus, 100%. And, uh, more aware of what is causing their discomfort 100% of the time. 
and the discomfort in patients is usually coming from family-related issues or work-related issues. If they say that they are at peace at work and at home, they're, they're okay. But if they're not, there's something that needs to be addressed here. So a connection is promoted if you have a spiritual practice. That's something that we uh, encourage. And of course, I have a lot of slides here, and I encourage you to read many of them because I'm not going to go through all of them. I wanted to present a lot of slides for your information that you can read later on. It has been shown that tumor conferences, by the way, one of the first tumor conferences in the United States was set up by Ben Carson. He's currently in the uh, administration. And when I was a resident at uh, Johns Hopkins, he was a neurosurgeon, implemented one of the first pediatric tumor boards. Tumor boards were implemented in pediatrics first because pediatric physicians were always disagreeing how to treat the kids. And the kids were falling through the cracks because the social worker wasn't in communication with the nurse. The nurse that put the med port was not communicating with the surgeon and the surgeon with the radiation oncology. So he figured he'll put them all in one room to discuss the cases. And that's the single most important predictor of survival in cancer patients. That doctor, doctors, number one, sit down to talk together about what treatment to give that patient. And this can apply to any other illness. And number two, that they don't necessarily have to agree, but they have to reach a consensus in that room. Number three, that I can challenge as a radiation oncologist the medical oncologist techniques, and he can challenge mine. But today, there's so much protection on each other's uh, knowledge that even in Puerto Rico, they tell me in two more boards, you cannot challenge what I do. Just talk about radiation therapy. And I said, no, that's not the point. The point is to challenge everything we do because nobody knows everything. So when I got to Puerto Rico, Originally, the percent of phone calls that were returned to me by oncologists was 1.7%. By me talking about it in different lectures, it went up to 75%. But right now, unfortunately, it's 0% practically. So they don't like to speak to each other. That's a very important thing that you should ask your doctor whether he does that or not. And another thing that can increase the survival of patients in a simple way is exercise. There are many randomized studies that show that in cancer, exercise can increase the survival by 5%. That's a lot. And I, I'll show you in context what 5% means. Uh, it increases survival. Many studies have shown this. And there's a website that we use as physicians called Adjuvant Online, the second one there. I've used it for 25 years. I entered the data of the patient, the age, the tumor size, estrogen, progesterone, receptor positive, positive axillary nodes, negative. And it will give me the five and 10 year survival of that patient and the contribution of the cure to the patient from surgery, from chemotherapy, and from hormones. So it's beautiful. This is what should be shown to every, not just breast cancer. Breast cancer is, just happens to be the most common cancer in the United States, but it should be shown to every patient because it, because it explains why do we recommend what we recommend. Now, I want to show you to compare meditation, that I show you the figures already, doubling survival, etc., cetera, halving recurrence rates, exercise increasing survival by 5%, and let me compare with two extreme cases of breast cancer, favorable and unfavorable. unfavorable. Unfortunately, Adjuvant Online, which has been running in the United States for 25 years, is under repair. The website has been under repair for three years. They don't want it out there because the patients were wising up saying, wait a minute, you're giving me chemotherapy with a 2% advantage? So out of 100 females, maybe two will benefit. What are you talking about? An exercise is five females out of 100? What's going on here? So the only website in the world available now is PREDICT. It's in the UK. So PREDICT UK. Adjuvant Online will send you to PREDICT. So the, the British have not backed down. They have the website. 
And an example, I took a patient, unfortunately you can't see it very well, but if you go to the slides, you'll see it. A postmenopausal female with negative nodes. 60 years old, two centimeter tumor, negative nodes, estrogen receptor positive. And these are the survival curves. You see all that dark? The first curve on the left is 93% five year survival that patient has. The next one is a 10 years. It's an 87% 10 year survival. That's pretty good. But you know what the blue, dark blue violet represents? The cure from surgery, which is almost 96% of the cure is from surgery. Do you see the, the green and the orange lines? <laughs> you, can, you can barely see them. That's the contribution from chemotherapy and hormones. But unfortunately, they make you think, like, if you don't do chemotherapy, you're not going to be cured. If you don't do hormones for 10 years, you're not going to be cured. This is deceiving information, fraudulent at, at, at the worst, because the figures are right here. Now, if we go to a more unfavorable situation, premenopausal female with positive nodes, same size of tumor, estrogen receptor positive, again, the survival of five years is not as bad as you would think in the UK. In the United States, it's worse. We have worse conditions of food, drinking water, and air in the United States than the UK. But that can be debatable in London. But the five-year survival is comparable to the favorable female that I just presented and the five-year as well. Again, the contribution from chemotherapy and Hormones, it's much less than the contribution from exercise, stress reduction, and meditation. And there's another study with fruits and vegetables. It's not randomized, but it shows also an increase in 5% survival. To this, we present to all our patients. This is one of the most important slides that I presented because President Obama asked the National Cancer Institute the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Health and Human Services. What is causing cancer in the United States? This was in 2008. In 2010, this report came out, which should be spread all over the place. If you go to the NCI website and ask for a copy, they'll send it to you. I encourage you to get one. It's a 250-page report. And the report says, Mr. President, what's causing most of the cancer in the United States, as you all can imagine, they put it in one picture. They say 95% probably of the cancers. We don't know for sure, maybe two thirds, maybe 95% are caused by what we're putting in this picture. And as you can see, pollution of the air, pollution of the water, pollution of the food with pesticides and x-rays in hospitals. The information had been there for 15 years, but the Bush administration had not uh, taken it out. And as you know, fortunately, Dr. Yanagi Sawa from Japan has shown that uh, the intravenous vitamin C given to Japanese workers of the Fukushima Daiichi plant did not develop cancer as opposed to the ones that did not get vitamin C. And that's a very important piece of information. They've been trying to knock at the government's door for years to no avail. But they have the data and, and it's compelling. So we tell our patients that are going through radiation based on the doctor's data to get vitamin C before and after and not to worry too much if they're doing vitamin C because that, that will neutralize a great part, if not all, of the radiation-related uh, car carcinogenic properties. And the report not, doesn't stop there. there. The first recommendation of the report is to never go with your shoes on into your home because you're increasing the cancer incidence of your family. If you analyze what's under the shoes after walking in downtown USA, whatever city, you'll find radioactive uranium, mercury, lead. Where do you think that, on lead, that lead gasoline lead went to? 
It didn't went into thin air, it went to the floor, into the environment. It's been mixed up. Pesticides. Now, for the past 20 years, I do not allow my patients to walk in the clinics with their shoes on. We put booties or they take their shoes off. And the incidence of infections of Medport that are put in cancer patients and used in our clinic went from 15% infection rate. They get infected because that's just the nature of the beast. It went down to zero in the last eight years 15, that we started looking at it again. And the air conditioner filters, instead of requiring a monthly cleaning, which we still do, they don't get dirty until three months afterwards. So all these things are important for your health and your patient's health. Second recommendation, never drink water out of uh, plastic bottles, ever, never, or food, no matter what the temperature. No plastic containers, organic food, and no hormones in the food. Did you see this in every major newspaper in the United States? Unfortunately, no. The, the official story is that cancer is called by genetics. Well, genetics has a role, of course, but what messed up the genetics to begin with? The mitochondrial dysfunction due to stress and due to pollutants, poor nutrition, etc., lack of exercise. And the ICD-10 preview draft back then in 2014, and that number is wrong. It had 5,000 codes for every cancer in the United States to be treated with chelation therapy. The Europeans are already using chelation therapy and showing that it can treat, prevent most cancers. And the codes were submitted, and I got the codes, but they were uh, taken out of the final draft by the, um, by the North American uh, USA doctors. But this happened, and Medicare was paying chelation therapy for heavy metal toxicity until three years ago. We use chelation therapy in our patients as a very important part of our practice because we found that just about everybody has heavy metals. This is an analysis of 51 patients in Vieques. Vieques is where the US Marine were, uh, were practicing target practice for about 60 years. And even though there's pollution everywhere in the planet, we wanted to study this population. And as you can see, 100% of the patients had led in a 24-hour urine collection. This is by Genova Diagnostics. Mercury, 65%, aluminum, 92%, arsenic, 100% of the patients, cadmium, 98 uranium, 33%, nickel, 65%. And Huggins, this is a misspelled last name, Huggins uh, told us that parts per billion and parts per trillion of heavy metals in the body were significant for the production of disease. So there's no safe level of metal in the body. And we would do a pre and post EDTA calcium provocation with the IV push technique that we've been using for 14 years. We don't use the three hour infusion anymore is less uh, time consuming and it has been more effective in our hands. And we show that there's expulsion of the metals, the pre, you can see on the left hand side column and the post, the metals shoot up after the chelation, proving that there's metal in the tissue and that this technique can help remove it. And I wanted to show you this slide because this is the, what I consider the most important strategy, prevention. In a Swiss population that did chelation for 20 years, there was a 90% reduction in cancer mortality after treatment with EDTA. These were 2,039 patients studied over 18 years, compared to a Swiss population of the same age, of the same characteristics that was not treated. The mortality on the treated patients over 18 years was 1.7%, and on the ones that were untreated was 17.4, 10 times more cancer mortality. So this is definitely the strategy we recommend to our patients, removing the heavy metals that we know are carcinogenic. A very, Easy way to measure the amount of uh, 
oxidative stress in the body and toxins in the body is by using salivary pH. The salivary pH will start measuring before each meal, we do it three times a day before each meal, do a table of food and pH. And as the patient starts doing all these techniques, the pH should be getting better. If the pH is always acidic in the morning and gets better during the day, that's, that's almost diagnostic of a dental disease. We unfortunately don't have biological dentistry in Puerto Rico. So we've been struggling to get these patients evaluated properly. Some of them we send to uh, the United States, but most cannot do that. But we recognize the importance of that. We have to deal with the dental situation and the chronic inflammation of the dental, which is basically seen in all the cancer patients that I see. We do IV push with EDTA chelation therapy. These are 250 patients that we treated. The indications in these particular patients were elevated cholesterol, lipids, high blood pressure, cardiac symptomatology, chronic renal failure, diabetes, and arthritis. And the monitoring was done by the regular blood test, pH three times a day. Every six treatments, we repeat the blood work. Organic food, as we have heard here so many times, organic food, more vegetables, removal of sugar and starches. At the time, we used goji berries, not available anymore in the form that you use, so we use enzymes, chlorella, probiotics, and vitamin C by mouth. Those four things are our initial detoxification while they change their diet. And we give 20% of the dose of chelation the first week, 40% the second week, and we increase until at the fifth week we're at 100%. It's very important to go slow, otherwise they'll get sick. Another technique we use when patients do intravenous vitamin C or chelation and get sick from an overload of toxins is to give them enemas that same day, and that same day they usually get better. The most common cause of uh, oxidative stress symptomatology is that the person is, is constipated. Constipation means one bowel movement a day. So two to three bowel movements a day is what we want. One bowel movement a day is considered constipation. Because we don't eat one time a day, we eat three times a day. And the results, lowering of total cholesterol in 85% of the patients, glucose levels 92%, disappearance of joint pains in 95% of the patients, more energy and sleeping better in 100% of the patients. And these are symptoms very, very commonly seen in cancer patients. So there are some things we want to improve in those patients. So it's a, an adjunct to the treatment we do with our patients. Because we saw the report of the President's Cancer Panel, and we were aware of these things way before they were apparent in the literature. We did a, a program that involved the treatment of patients that had been given no hope with cancer. Most of them had stage four disease. And we did a detoxification, regeneration, peace promoting protocol every day. So every three, uh, I'm sorry, three times a week, we'll do intravenous vitamin C. Every day, we'll do massage in a massage table. Every day, we'll do ozone bath and steam bath. Every day, we will do biofeedback. Three times a week, we will do massage by a massage therapist. And every day, we will put chelation, I'm sorry, every three days, we will put ozone intravenously and chelation therapy in the IV bag. And we did this for three weeks to see if there was any response. This was several years ago. If there was a response, we were going to pursue the detoxification literature that at the time was not very extensive. And we had 40 patients, all of them previously treated, all had progressive disease, six had con uh, failed conventional therapy, but no patient was on concomitant chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation. And uh, 
The other patients have failed a combination two or three or four times. So six patients failed conventional therapy one time. Others had failed two to three to four to five times. So these are heavily treated patients. Initial program was for three weeks. There was an optional maintenance that patients will do afterwards, but that's not discussed. We wanted to analyze the initial three weeks. We will do high resolution blood imaging, massage with aqua massage every day, biofeedback every day that measures respiration rate, steam bath, ozone bath, we built this machine in order to deliver the ozone through the skin. And the vitamin C was given in 20 gram intervals until 70 grams or tolerance was achieved. We added vitamin B1, B6, B12, and EDTA to the bag. The dose range was 50 to 70 grams in this patient. And of course, ozone hyperthermia showers five times a week, half hour treatments. The results in these patients was an in response means that the tumor shrank either 50% or more. Less than 50% shrinkage is not considered a response. So the initial response was 72% in the overall group of 40 patients. So that was encouraging. But at 18 months, the results were 42%. So if they did not continue a program of detoxification, they, they regrew the tumor. And a complete response was seen in roughly 18% of the patients. Symptoms always precede tumor response. In other words, they initially started feeling better, sleeping better, and with more energy and emotional well-being. And all patients that responded started looking and feeling better. So the protocol is rejuvenating. And this is an example of a metastatic uterine cancer to the lymph nodes. You can see the lymph nodes here in the wall, this one here, this one here. As, as the patient went through treatment, there's a marked reduction in that lymph node that we saw previously, and this one here. A metastatic lung cancer, as you can see this metastasis here, and it has reduced markedly after the protocol. Another patient with Hodgkin's disease, the outer circle is the initial lymph node, and after two months, we see it here reduced. This is a patient with a stage four lymphoma and AIDS. As you can see the mass here, and here, Everything that looks white around here is tumor. Fat looks dark, and is what we should have in the, in, the, in, in the peritoneal cavity. This is a distended bowel, tumor here, tumor over here. And after five months, you see there's no evidence of tumor, and the fat planes are preserved, which is the dark. The patient has been in remission up until about eight months ago that I did a follow-up on him, almost 20, uh, 20 years later. The side effects include, include two patients with malaise due to vitamin C, resolved in 10 minutes after stopping infusion. One patient had chills from an infected catheter, and one patient has skin pimples. If the patients travel to our clinic less than 35 minutes, the response is better than if they travel more, and they usually travel one to three hours. So traveling in a car, and it didn't matter if you drove the car or were in the back sleeping. That constant movement of the car back and forth is making the unconscious proprioceptors in the body to contract to accommodate for the position changes. So you're constantly working out in the car and spending energy, and that's the reason why. So we recommend the patients travel and stay do a few treatments, then travel back, not the same day. Because they used to try to do all this the same day, travel back and forth. Okay. 
So the goals of the treatment are to promote well-being in our patients, remove toxins, and regenerate tissue. And this is the program that we recommend if we can get Goji in our patients, that can be substituted by digestive enzymes, chlorella, probiotics, vitamin C by mouth, meditation CD, and essential oils. We recommend these things to all of our patients. It's a very simple thing, and you will see the pH getting better, meaning the toxins are coming out of the body. And we do that for two weeks before we do the IVs, and unless the patient is really sick. Because we want to show them how the supplements are working, number one. Number two, how implemented the dietary changes also is changing their pH, therefore their toxic load, and their general well-being when the pH goes from acidic to alkaline. Of the patients we managed like this for cancer palliation, because we didn't expect them to improve, six patients went through this protocol of vitamin C and supplements by mouth. There was improvement of symptoms in half of the patients. So there was an enhancement of quality of life, but it didn't help all the patients. Of the ones that we treated for side effects from chemotherapy and radiation, of the 13 patients, 100% had resolution of the symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, joint pain, diarrhea, insomnia, low energy, bronchitis, allergies, asthma, and leg swelling. By the way, Puerto Rico legalized the use of medicinal cannabis a, a year ago. And uh, we've been using it for 30 years well, by the name of Marinol. It's a prescription drug which, by the way, is extracted out of the plant. They add two alcohol groups to make it more absorbable, and they call it dodrabinol. But it's extracted from the plant. And it, it gets the patients just as high as the regular cannabis, and they say it but it will take away nausea and vomiting in practically 100% of the patients. And number two, I've been able to stop narcotic medications in 75% of our patients overnight by using this pill. 2.5 milligrams, one to three times a day of Marinol. If you have a DEA number, you can order it in any, uh, for any patient. And they, you have 20, the patient has 24 hours to pick up the prescription, if you put the date and the time in the prescription. So unless you have cannabis laws in your state, if you don't, you can still prescribe THC has been legal for 30 years. Most physicians don't know that. We'll be, we've been using it in the oncologic arena for decades, and it's incredibly useful, especially for pain, nausea, and vomiting. So yeah, but, but I, I predict that uh, Marijuana will be taking out of the Schedule One by next year in the United States. That's the trend that we're seeing. The results of the vitamin C intravenously as the only treatment for patients. We have 61 treatments with the, 61 patients with the, this was the only treatment. They didn't do chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation for some time before we analyze the tumor response. And most of them were stage four. So they were not given a lot of promising options by the regular oncologic conventional arena. And 72% of the patients responded with at least 50% reduction of tumor, which is a, a very promising response rate. And this included the symptom response rate. So how their symptoms improved by 50% were also included in this figure. So it's not only tumor response, but tumor and symptom response. Reduction of tumor was seen in 45% of the patients. And uh, there was increased energy and well-being in practically uh, uh, the majority of patients. Increased quality of life, improvement of symptoms. Four, seven percent had a complete response. But this is one of the most interesting things that we found, that patients that stop, and unfortunately, I'm talking a lot about chemotherapy because the oncologists have the monopoly of 
uh, cancer treatment in Puerto Rico. So almost everybody's getting chemotherapy in Puerto Rico, which I think is, is an outrage. But we barely see patients, rarely see patients that don't get or don't want chemotherapy or are smart enough to see the difference between what he can offer and what is uh, implied to offer. And some patients that have stopped responding to chemotherapy by adding vitamin C intravenously, they restart responding like they did a year or two earlier up to the point of complete remission. Two patients who failed chemotherapy started responding again. One example is a stage four breast cancer unresponsive to Taxol, Tyker, Herceptin, Taxol for three years. When she was on Taxol, which was the fourth chemotherapeutic strategy that she was changed to, we started intravenous vitamin C. We told her, don't, don't stop Taxol yet. Tell your doctor to continue it. And the doctor said, sure, why, why not? I'm, I'm still uh, cashing in here, so why not? So we started intravenous vitamin C, and the patient has been in complete remission for six years with a chemotherapy they previously did not respond to. Another patient had a CEA of 3,250 from a stage four adenocarcinoma of the colon with liver metastases. On Camtosar and 5-FU, she initially responded, CA went down to 100, and then rose again to 5,000 on chemotherapy. We told her to continue the chemotherapy, start her vitamin C with the same chemotherapy, and the CA went down to 20. We repeated a PET-CT. There was a residual liver metastasis was operated, and the patient was with no evidence of disease January 2014. These are, hold on for a second here. These are patients that did concomitant intravenous vitamin C with chemotherapy plus or minus radiation. 29 cancer patients, 27 had reduced side effects, 15 were complete responders. You would expect a complete response in 25% of patients that get chemotherapy for breast cancer. So we're seeing twice the amount of responses that we will be expecting. You know, what's one of the most powerful negative prognostic factors in breast cancer or other cancers is following your oncologist's recommendation to stop intravenous vitamin C during chemotherapy. Some people were doing really well. The oncologist says, stop that. It's making the treatment worse. And inevitably, unfortunately, the patient rapidly progressed and died. So we saw that in about seven cases. The med ports that get vitamin C through the med port, which is a, a port that we use for cancer patients so we don't use their arm veins, the rate of infection has gone down to zero at this point. So vitamin C is treating the med port for prevention of infections. And the complications that we see are Definitely uh, less and tolerable, tolerable. Here's another example of a patient with a leukemia of the brain. After going through this protocol, there's no evidence of disease. Another patient with a metastatic lymphoma to the bones this is a PET-CT. And as you can see, everything that you see really dark in the bones is tumor. Humerus, femur, around the pelvis, around the, the whole spine. And after the protocol, the PET-CT is almost normal. There's only a residual in the right, lo right middle lobe. You see that over here? And yesterday there were randomized studies presented. There's four randomized studies that are encouraged you to give your patients about the use of intravenous vitamin C do, with chemotherapy in several conditions is shown to decrease side effects in almost every system in the body. Neurological, hematologic, musculoskeletal, gastrointestinal, ophthalmological, and, and so forth. And this study by Anderson is a 35-page study worth giving the patients to give to the oncologist as well. And we do those reports to give the patients to give the oncologist 
because it shows a vitamin C intravenous of my mouth with almost all oncologic agents in the market, there's favorable in vitro, in vivo, animal and clinical studies in the vast majority of these. So I encourage you to read it and I encourage you to give it to your patients so they can give it to the oncologist. So in conclusion, as we have seen in the last couple of days, Intravenous vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide with nutritional supplements may be highly effective to the management of the overall management of cancer. Seems to increase the response rate of conventional chemotherapy. High dose vitamin C seems may decrease side effects of therapy and improve quality of life. Do you see how my wording has changed? It may, it seems to decrease because this slide I was given to a, a group of conventional oncologists. So they don't like it when you say it does decrease the, the so I put, this is a totally, uh, so they wouldn't throw me out in the middle of the lecture. May decrease side effects is, is something you do in conventional medicine. May reduce or eliminate tumors. Oral dosing for viral illnesses. And Viral illnesses have been related and correlated with cancer for many years. Cancer of the thyroid, Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus is causing most lymphomas in Puerto Rico and is associated with many cancers and autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus disease. If anybody's hypothyroid, do a Epstein-Barr viral capsid antigen IgG and a nuclear antigen IgG. If they're both positive, there's a very good chance they're chronically infected. Chronically infected means that you got infected as a teenager or in college, and then through becoming weaker and weaker over the next decades, you reactivate it into bothering you again. So for the flu and other things, as you can see, as Dr. Levy was saying, frequency is more important than the total dose. So sometimes giving the vitamin C 1,000 milligrams every hour is the way to go. And after four hours, the first thing that will improve in, in the cold is congestion. And then general molest by the fifth and sixth hour. So pretty quickly, they'll be able to breathe. That's the main problem with the cold. The main problem is you cannot br breathe properly and cannot sleep very well because of that congestion. So the congestion is what responds to the first, one of the first responder symptoms with vitamin C therapy, so frequency. And as you can see, doses for children two to six years old are there. And you can give safely a, a child a, a thousand milligrams of live on three times a day. And sometimes two, three times a day. So when an adult of my, when my patients come to my clinic all, all proud that they're taking a thousand milligrams of vitamin C every day, I tell them that's, a, that's not even a newborn's dose. We started using uh, treatments for viruses because we see the correlation between tumors and viruses. So managing viruses is very important. And hydrogen peroxide influenza was used for the first time in uh, 1920. And there was a reduction in mortality from 80 to 48 percent just using hydrogen peroxide. So we use hydrogen peroxide and vitamin C. We had here 57 cases of suspected influenza. We gave ascorbic acid 20 to 25 milligram, 20 to 25 grams with hydrogen peroxide. Based on that only study in the literature, and 100% of the patients had a decrease of 50% or more of their symptoms by the end of a two, four hour infusion time. And one patient of suspected meningoencephalitis that was totally disoriented. By the time it was the third or fourth hour, she was completely conscious again. Chikungunya hit us hard back in 2014. Every office of every doctor and every emergency room was overwhelmed. That, that was amazing. And I won't go into the details of chikungunya, but basically it accelerated the aging process. And it hit younger population of athletes like I've never seen before. Usually the younger athletes don't get the diseases as much, but chikungunya didn't uh, discriminate here. 
we saw a lot of marathon runners, triathletes, and they, everybody that got this disease, and we saw they would feel like they were getting older. They could not walk, literally, from the pain. So we treated these patients with uh, intravenous vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide, and we had a roughly 'Okay. This is the pain from a scale to zero to 10, which is we did a pain score of all the sides that were hurting. And we did a statistical analysis of the before the IV pain score. So as you can see, most patients had a pain score of seven to 10. One, two, three, four bars is seven to 10. That's excruciating pain right before the treatment. And then we measure the pain score in a scale from zero to 10. Zero being the less, having no pain, and 10 having the worst pain of your life. And after, immediately after the treatment, we repeated the pain score. And it went down in the majority of people from one to four, which is tolerable in the vast majority, 71% of the patients. But this was not like the flu. Most of them treated only once, not most, 25% will recur with pain the next day. So we found that we had to treat these patients three days in a row. We, we never treated a virus for such a long time, but three days in a row, and uh, much stronger than the flu for sure. And after three days, most of these patients, 95% were completely free of pain. They had been with pain for months. So we published this, and by the way, Tom Levy is very modest, but Tom Levy helped me write that, and he's a co-author of that paper of chikungunya. So thank you very much for your company, and have a good day. So it looks like we'll have- Oh, oh by the way, how's, has the pain improved on the people that did the pain? Raise your hand. Oh, thank you. Okay. We have time for just a few questions. Hello. Um, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Uh, can you, I have been using, mainly in the treatment of the chronic degenerative disorders for the last 20 years, and the circulatory disorders, cardiovascular disease, magnesium disodium EDTA. Uh, why would you use calcium EDTA instead of magnesium disodium EDTA, or what would the difference be here? Why? If, you uh, use ma if we use magnesium or sodium EDTA for a rapid, rapid I mean five to 10 minute infusion of the same quantity that calculates for the magnesium EDTA, it will shut down the kidneys immediately. So calcium EDTA will not shut down the kidneys. It's the only one that you can give rapidly. Yeah, but we're talking here about um, three-hour infusions. Oh, I then there's no problem. You can give any of them for th in three hours with no problem. But, the, the, but we have logistic problems in Puerto Rico where people live far away and, and all the things, they work, they have to work, they cannot be three hours uh, away many times. So magnesium EDTA you would recognize as being a, a, very, a, a very good treatment uh, once you know, with the three-hour infusion. Uh, not, uh, the, no, calcium EDTA I consider now in my hands and my practice with my population uh, to be more effective and easier on the patients for treating either cardiovascular disease, removal of heavy metals, etc. Okay, thank you. I have better results too. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, my thank question you. is... My understanding was that high-dose vitamin C produces hydrogen peroxide extracellularly. So why um, are you given hydrogen peroxide and the vitamin C if... To potentiate the effect of the peroxide effect of vitamin C. And we, we've been using both and sometimes just vitamin C. And in our experience, we, we seem to have better results when we mix both of them for viral diseases. Okay, so when you combine it with the chemotherapy, are you trying to get an antioxidant effect or a pro-oxidant effect? Both, yes. So you're getting both 
at the high dose level. I thought the low dose level gave an antioxidant effect and the high dose level gave a pro-oxidant effect. So I'm just trying to get that distinction and be clear when, when to use. Uh, I do it one? in a more simple way. Okay. I, I compare the patients I have done without the hydrogen peroxide and I see that when I add hydrogen peroxide, they do better. That's number one. The other thing we use that we should not be using is vitamin C and glutathione the same day. Right. But I do it the same day and I see better results. Okay. So I use the clinical judgment and eye to guide me through things that uh, most of our colleagues will not agree with. And I respect that. Okay, thank you.